evening, everyone. Happy holidays. I'm Mark Hayne. And I'm Susan Simon. Welcome to People of 2014, the stories that touched our lives. It's been a remarkable year. Yes. We're going to look back at some of the people and their stories that made us laugh, cry, and think. And in the next half hour, we want to share those stories and update you on the people we met in 2014. We begin tonight with a local family who 30 years ago were in the national spotlight. Yeah, we first met Ken and Sue Massey on the day their family farm was sold off to the highest bidder. Many people have wondered over the years, what happened to that family? Well, the answers are revealed in Sue Massey's new memoir. Every Wisconsin farm has a story, and this is where Sue Massey wrote hers in her bedroom sanctuary on her iPad. It was kind of percolating, and it felt very unfinished. Mm -hmm. So I kept looking at that photograph thinking, but that's just a photograph. There's so much more to the story. For three generations, the Massey family lived and worked on the land in Hollandale. This was my dream to raise our kids on that farm, but this was every fabric of his being. I mean, he grew up there, his dad grew up there, and his grandfather grew up there, so certainly was extremely devastating for, for Kenny. But 30 years later, it's still hard to even talk about. Oh, like, yeah. oh yeah. It's still it's right the, there. The pain is still there, you bet. It was March 4th, 1986, a year when land values and commodity prices plummeted while interest rates skyrocketed. The Masseys were at the Iowa County Courthouse in Dodgeville for the most painful moment they would ever face. After 80 years, the Massey family farm was on the auction block. Subject to unpaid 1984 and 1985 real estate taxes. There were two bids, the highest offering less than half the value of the 324 acres. Anybody $46,000? $45,000 once, $45,000 twice. That we've sold the farm for $45,000. The Masseys and their five small children had hit rock bottom. Boy, I've been so low. It's been just terrible. And for these farmers and businessmen, <laughs> it isn't worth suicide. Your family needs you. You just gotta, you gotta make it. You gotta stay for your family. It's just, you have to. You have just, to, you have to talk. You have to keep the lines of communication open because once you hold it inside of you, It'll, it'll eat you up alive. A photographer for the Wisconsin State Journal, L. Roger Turner, captured the Massey's anguish with a single click. But I think when they snapped that photograph, it was like at that very moment, the breath ceased of something that you loved and it just stopped right there. And I think that's what was caught. The Masseys were on the front page of papers around the country. Ken and Sue never accepted any aid from the hundreds of people who sent money, some in envelopes addressed only to Hollandale, Wisconsin. And when people start selling you a dollar bill and they start telling you their stories, how are you going to take their money? You can see your daughter um, fighting so hard to be strong. Which one of your kids was that? That was our oldest daughter, Kelly. Just 10 at the time, the Massey children are all grown now. Kelly is 38 and a nurse in California. The baby Sue was holding that day was Naomi. She's still the baby of the family at 30. Where did you go the day after the auction? We moved off the farm and into a rental home, kind of the fringes of Hollandale, Barneveld area, so the kids could stay in their school district. We were there three years. Then Kenny got a university job, and that was our ticket into Madison. For more than 20 years now, Ken and Sue have run a landscaping business out of their Middleton home. Their giant snowman sign is a winter icon on Mineral Point Road. A spacious treehouse and backyard chickens make it feel like being on the farm. What does it feel like to be back here? It's been a long time. On his 63rd birthday, Ken went back to Hollandale. Just like the family, the old farm has weathered some storms. Does it feel like yesterday or does it feel like a long time ago? It, it feels both. It's, it's kind of odd. Part of you could just run up the hill and just 
be there again. And then another part of you is like, it's in the but past. the house was brown. <laughs> it makes you think about when they, they say, you can never go back. There's something to be said about that. But they can't take the memories from you either. In the book, Sue reveals a painful personal secret that she never had the courage to talk about until now. The couple who purchased the farm 30 years ago still own the property today. Quite a story. It is. And just after you aired that story, they came onto the station and paid a personal visit. Yep. It was great to meet them. It was great to meet them. They're doing well. They just celebrated their 40th wedding anniversary, which another, is another story in itself. But they're uh, thriving, and all of their kids are doing well, too. And they have a sheet suit. And they do. Mm -hmm. Sophie made a cameo. Even better. <laughs> Continue luck to them. Next, it is a simple story of a boy and his horse. Photojournalist Kathy King introduces us to a dynamic duo on a journey to make dreams come true for hundreds of children. This is Edward. He's a good horse. He's actually a paint horse. He's my best friend. He really is. He's got a little bit of quarter horse and walking horse in him. I started out in Batesville, Arkansas. What I'm doing is I'm riding into 48 states of the United States to benefit a charity called Western Wishes. They're a nonprofit organization that grant wishes to terminally ill children, or basically if they have any illness at all, like a girl wanting to ride in a buggy to, you know, just anything. We try to grant them a wish. I've been on the road since March 15th. I go and I give speeches. I get pledges from businesses. I, uh, I do a lot of church speeches. Just basically anything and everything. Well, I'm riding about six or seven miles today. It's pretty hot. I'm taking it easy on Edwards, so. And how much longer do you think you'll be? Um, two to three years. It's going to take me a little bit to get there. This ain't an overnight trip. I would like to raise at least $30,000 for Western Wishes. I'm trying to make a difference for kids out there and seeing the smile on their face. It makes the whole ride worth it. That's what I'm doing this for, and I feel called to do this. If you want to help Ty and Edward on their trip, you can head to their website, AmericanWishRide.com. When People of 2014 continues, a lesson learned from a terrible tragedy. We'll meet the families behind a national campaign to speak up and slow down. everyone. In the last year, we've had stories that inspired us and those that left us with a lesson. This is one of them. Three Campbellsport High School students died in a traffic crash. Speed was the cause. And now that deadly crash is fueling a nationwide campaign. Only News 3's Danica Lewis brings us one mother's indescribable grief put into words for everyone to hear. They say you live and you learn, but sometimes it's not living, but losing, that brings a lesson. Beechnut Drive is a well-known shortcut in Campbellsport, a road of few curves and even less traffic. All it took was one car ending up like this to make it a drive-by memorial. I don't want any other family to have to go through losing a child. Um, out of a bad choice that somebody else made. Candy Stahl's daughter, Sabrina, was the talkative type, a social butterfly. She had just met her new soccer teammates the night of February 4th, 2012. I miss her, everything about her. Sabrina made the varsity squad for her speed, but speed would end her life before playing her first high school game. She should be out there, and we didn't get that opportunity to see that. With nine girls packed into her car, the teammate behind the wheel tried to make the road a roller coaster, going at least 85, with the speed limit at 35. The car swerved, left the road, and rolled over at least five times. No, I'm okay. Can somebody be okay? Honda Lake County 911, where is your emergency? That would have been an accident. Okay. Well, and I tried texting her and calling her and got nothing. Katie Berg, Caitlin Scannell, and Sabrina all died. You gotta let your kids know that they're not invincible. Teresa, are you okay, honey? 
you all teenagers? Or? We're all teenagers, yes. We were, I was driving too fast down the road, and I got us all into an accident. Oh. And I feel like I'm carrying on their message for them. Greg Burmeister didn't know the families who lost children. I cry a lot. <laughs> but the video producer did notice there weren't any tools for teaching Wisconsin teens about the dangers of speeding. There was the sense that maybe we could make a difference, maybe take a different approach and get the passengers to be more concerned about their safety. In a 26-minute video, the pain of those parents became a message. Speak up to slow down. It will save lives. If we don't tell that story, what is the lesson? We're going to start off with the syllabus, you guys. Terry Costello didn't have the girls in class. All right, let's take a look at this. But she knew them. These girls were at our house, at my home, on a regular basis. They actually TP'd her house that night the last place they were. That's gonna be our goal. Before the crash. They were good students, they were good people. Costello started sharing the Speak Up to Slow Down video with her Future Farmers of America chapter. I want them to understand the heartbreak. The group is now writing a different future. Students signing on, pledging not to speed, and meaning it. Every kid can put themselves in the shoes you know, that, that that could just as easily be me. They've already shown the video to FFA members from across Wisconsin, and soon... Respect everybody in this classroom, please. They'll share it nationwide. Nobody intended for this to happen. People make choices, from the clothes that you wear to the food that you eat. And when you choose to push that accelerator all the way to the floor, that is a choice. This stone just has their names on it. Now a memorial for Katie, Caitlin, and Sabrina sits right next to the soccer field a field named for those three angels. At the end of the day, it's still the same result. And for a mother who used to hug her daughter before bed every night. No, it doesn't get any easier. Candy continues to live with what she's learned, hoping others will learn from it and live. It's a horrible feeling. It's, a, it's tragic for us. And the sooner we could get the word out there, the better and the more lives hopefully that we can save. Speak Up and Slow Down was featured at the National FFA Convention and in its national magazine. It's currently being used by around 75 Wisconsin schools. It's really making a difference. It's a teachable moment out of a tragedy. Absolutely. Up next, everyone can relate to our next story. If you drive in Wisconsin, you are familiar with road salt. Our Adam Schrager found one road crew up north that is using one of the state's most famous products to solve one of our biggest problems. First shift workers around the state know the dread every winter. We have 24 hour coverage pretty much. At the FNA Dairy in Dresser, Wisconsin. 110,000 pounds of cheese a day. While the mozzarella may start its day on a lazy river. I expect them to be at work. Chuck Engdahl's workers cannot. If you can get out of your driveway, you should be able to make it to work. No excuse. Mo Norby runs Polk County's highway department. I love my job. Love it. He's the guy single-handedly responsible for getting rid of one of the best I'm going to be late excuses in Wisconsin. I used to tell my daughter when she was going to high school that, you know, my, my goal was to make sure that you don't have a snow day. And <laughs> didn't make her happy. His crews don't just drop salt and sand. I think we're ahead of the curve. As well as the straightaways in this northern Wisconsin county. You're trying to look for a better product that's going to get you there at a more economical cost. Mo Norby knows how his high school chemistry teacher would react to what came next. Probably be surprised, I guess. Surprised that his informal lab results found the solution to the county salt and money shortage. There's quite a bit of salt in this water. Just down the road at the FNA Dairy. This is the magic water here. 23 to 24 percent salt in the cheese brine. In the past, the dairy paid tens of thousands of dollars each year to dispose it. We're just looking for other things to do with it. And we talked to Mo. It was worth a try. Anything is worth a try when you get to try it for free. Mo's drivers reported the cheese brine mixed with the salt cleared the roads 
faster. It's pretty simple science. The highway commissioner is even more impressed with the economics involved. You always have interest in anything that might save you money. Tens of thousands of dollars in extra salt that they don't have to drop, all due to a uniquely Wisconsin idea. Well, in this industry, you never turn your nose up to anything. The nose knows a lot about cheese. No, there's no smell. But don't believe the speculation that there's an odor in Polk County. It doesn't leave cheese curds on the road or anything like that. No, the cheese itself is produced at the dairy. It's one of the best cheeses in the industry right now. By donating the brine to the county, Chuck Engdahl saves enough money to keep an extra worker on the payroll. It's a good chunk of change. And speaking of his workers... Oh, they'll always have an excuse. They may show up late to work some days, but don't blame that on Mo Norby. I hope we're the main factor on making sure all Chuck's people get to work and they don't have an excuse to say the roads are bad. And we're told this can be done anywhere a highway department is close to a dairy that makes mozzarella and provolone. Those are the only two cheeses with the salt content to make it work. Isn't that interesting? It's very interesting. Makes the drive delicious. Absolutely. Just thinking about it. Absolutely. When People of 2014 returns, the loss of a soldier touches everyone. We'll introduce you to a man who is bringing dignity and honor to making their last trip home. Welcome back to the people of 2014. It is possibly the most important thing we can do for our veterans. Thank them for their service and welcome them home. They leave their homes to defend this country. So for them, coming home holds great meaning. Mm -hmm. Dave Delosier has the story of a Wisconsin man building a homecoming. We're a combination here, body shop and auto repair. There is an art to all of this. When the rust is peeled away, what is left is brand new the day they came off the assembly line. In this shop, it is about making things right. I think we all have that pride, you know. For Richard Kalashian, that pride was learned more than 40 years ago in jungles and rice paddies. A pride in his country. It was the worst of wars, the Tet Offensive in 1968. The deadly battles of 1968, the Tet Offensive. He was 22. They had us pinned down for about, an, about a half hour. And he doubted if he'd see 23. I remember distinctly having tears in my eyes. I was actually crying somewhat. That this is the way I'm going to die here in the mud. The platoon he led met three divisions of the North Vietnamese Army in that mud, and death came with them. All night long, you could hear moaning and crying from the enemy, and it was very hard to. Uh, forget those sounds because they're human beings too, you know, and and you, you think that, that could be me. And there came a moment when it appeared it would. We couldn't hold them back. Uh, so the last resort was napalm, and so they dropped napalm. A few hundred yards, that's all that separated life and death. So close that he could feel the heat and smell the death for having the courage to call in a napalm strike to his own location. He was awarded the Bronze Star. I wear that to let other people know that just to, just to let them know that I serve. In 1968, though, service and sacrifice were anything but embraced here at home. When Richard Kalashian came home to avoid protesters, he had to hide from the past. When I arrived at O'Hare Field, um, they handed me the suitcases, and those were my civilian clothes, and I went into the men's room, and I actually changed clothes. And over the decades, that day at the airport stayed with him until he saw another veteran come home. They loaded the casket onto the cart, and that bothered me because here's a, here's a soldier that was fallen, you know, and I thought he deserved a little more respect than that, just to be put on a cart, just a plain old cart like he was baggage. So out of the shop where he works, Kalashian would change that. You know, they always have a saying that sometimes it just takes one person to get things going, but I guess that happened. With a baggage card donated by Southwest Airlines, Kalashian and his friends at work set out to do what they do best to make things right with colors, emblems, and words 
that honor. Just to make the whole community feel proud that they're welcoming home a fallen soldier. In a matter of a few weeks, this cart will be at the Milwaukee airport to help honor and welcome any veteran home. The importance of that is not lost. And there's an old saying, some gave some and some gave all. And here's one they gave all. And he deserves a little more respect and just a little more home, homecoming. Richard Palacian, maybe more than most, knows how important that is. And he wants you to remember that every veteran deserves to be welcomed home. I feel like we're, we're doing the right thing. Once completed, the cart will be kept at the Milwaukee Airport by Southwest Airlines, and they will make it available to any airline that is bringing home the remains of a veteran. Well, talking about the end of life is difficult, yet it is something we will all eventually face. That's why a local woman is sharing her pain. Wendy Kreps lost her husband, Keith, over the summer after a slow and agonizing decline. She credits a gifted Madison physician for showing her that even without a death with dignity bill, an incredible life can end with a beautiful death. This is Keith Kreps in happier times, on the water on his boat, Jollymon. An avid sailor who loved a good beer, Keith was an enthusiastic world traveler. His favorite trips were to the Caribbean with his wife, Wendy, and their two daughters. I love my muffin. <laughs> and I love my Wendy <laughs> He was everything to everyone. He was happy, excited joyful. Three years ago, Keith was just 56 and suffering symptoms no one could figure out after a third joint replacement. He had that joint replacement on uh, the weekend of Thanksgiving. And by our Christmas vacation, which we did annually every year with our kids, he wasn't recovering. He deteriorated very slowly um, at that point. It took a long time for him to reach his breaking point. A devastating turning point came when Keith fell in his wheelchair and broke his collarbone. The accident left him bedridden and unable to breathe. And when the doctor came back, um, he sat me down in the waiting room and told me that Keith was going to die. And it hit me like a ton of bricks. Our friend who was there with Keith, his mother knew of Dr. Campbell, Toby. And that's how he came to us. Via text message. <laughs> Via text message. <laughs> Dr. Toby Campbell is an oncologist and the chief of the palliative care program at UW Hospital. You know, anytime you're lost somewhere, right, what would be great is a guide. And I think approaching the end of your life, you can often feel lost and worried and scared. Dr. Campbell says it's difficult for some doctors to tell patients they're dying, which leads some people to die unprepared. Keith described to me a couple of things that were, I thought, pretty profound. The first, he said, uh, you know, if, if my life is a story, I feel like we hit the climax already. And I did it. And now I just feel like I'm in the lingering phase. He had done many things, had a party, and then a second party, and then a third party. And he said, I don't know that I have more energy for more parties. We had a lot of parties in the, bed <laughs> in the bedroom. <laughs> so he expressed himself as ready. Keith was dependent on a breathing machine to stay alive. Because he was home, he had options. I think most would agree that being dependent upon a machine, you could turn that machine off. Mm -hmm. And so we had that discussion. And then he decided, yeah, I'm ready for that. Keith picked the date, August 19th. Surrounded by family and friends, he made his transition. It was incredible. It was so special and it was so beautiful. Keith had a Bloody Mary and a beer and he laughed and we all told stories about how we knew him and how we loved him and he got to tell us right back and we all got to hold him and be with him. It was a gift. It was such a gift. You know it's often said that miracles sometimes don't look quite like we wanted them to look like or we were expecting. And I've told Wendy on a couple of occasions that I feel like I saw a miracle on that last day because in this saddest of times, on this most difficult of days, yeah. everyone was happy. Yeah. And that is, that's a miracle. 
Wendy is also very grateful to a Grace Hospice Care for their love and support in Keith's final days. It had to be so tough for her to do this, but how important it was. And this is her first holiday season without Keith, so important thing to remember. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, well, and the people of 2014 continues bringing music to those who are losing memory. A very special program that helps those diagnosed with Alzheimer's and dementia. Welcome back to our special People of 2014. We all have a connection to music. Familiar songs can drum up emotions. Mary Jo Ola shows us how a state agency is tuning up those connections. Hi. Hi there. How are you doing? At the memory unit in St. Mary's Care Center in Madison, everyone has a Grandpa Dave. Just a wonderful thing. Well, good, good. <laughs> his name is David O'Day. That's his daughter, Colleen Potter. Only the thing is, he doesn't remember her. He spent many years taking care of me, and I'll spend however many years I need taking care of him. Having severe Alzheimer's means there are days O'Day has trouble waking up or is very quiet. Are you handsome? Yes, I am. This is not one of those days. It's really nice that he still has his personality. A former radio man who served in World War II, O'Day also played the organ, the recorder, and sang in the church choir with his wife, Dorothy. Yep. With him, music was the last thing to go. I mean, he remembered music for a long, long time. But at 94 years old, music is back in his life. And you tell me if it's too loud, okay? The iPod is from the Wisconsin Music and Memory Initiative, part of a national program where nursing home staff personalize playlists for people diagnosed with Alzheimer's or related dementia. The music doesn't treat the disease, but it can do this. You can laugh when your dreams fall apart at the seams And life gets more exciting with each passing day His daughter lights up. He had completely forgotten music, although it was the last thing he forgot. Uh, now all of a sudden, he's remembering again. And that's giving him happiness. That is all a daughter could ever want. The reason why patients react the way they do to the music and memory program can be found here at the University of Wisconsin in Eau Claire. Dr. Dale Taylor, professor emeritus and a leader in music and brain research, speaks about the topic at conferences around the world. It's not magic. It's very scientific. He says music is the only stimulus known to activate the entire human brain. It can access connections that have been made that haven't been used for a while. And um, if a part is damaged, uh, the brain has the ability to reroute through making new connections uh, through undamaged parts of itself. The video he shared with us shows in real time how one person's brain reacts to music. Red is high activation, blue is low. When that's happening, the those neural connections, which we call neuroplasticity or brain plasticity. Um, and that's just the process of making those connections. And that happens throughout life. And uh, even for a person with dementia, in the undamaged parts of their brain, it's still capable of making new connections. If you need more convincing, Taylor says he was in college when a car accident put him in a coma. He suffered severe brain damage. But I made a full recovery, and I, I wanted to know why. And now I understand part of that was because I was a music major and the music was stimulating my brain. There is no cure for Alzheimer's disease. Potter will continue to visit her father and remind him of who she is. But the music helps. And really it doesn't matter if he remembers or doesn't remember as long as he's happy. Don't you know that it's worth every treasure on earth to be young at heart? And since our story aired, Wisconsin has expanded the music and memory program to 150 additional nursing homes. Do you know that is so true? You hear a song and memories come flooding back. Yeah, you understand the connection. Absolutely. Yeah, it makes sense. Well, it took 151 years, but a Wisconsin war hero finally received the honor he deserves. Our Dave Delosier introduces us to Lieutenant Alonzo Cushing and the woman who pushed for the Congressional Medal of Honor. Gettysburg 
is one of the most beautiful places on earth. There is a timelessness that surrounds you here. There's a feeling here, there's a spirit in the air. And I truly feel it's left behind by the veterans who fought here. Ground now sacred, made so by what was spilt here. So many lives, tens of thousands killed or wounded on these Pennsylvania farm fields. It's all on the line here. And Lee knows, if anybody, Lee really realizes how desperate this gamble is. After two long years of bloody fighting, the fate of the nation would be decided here. On the third day of the Battle of Gettysburg, with the Union holding the high ground on Cemetery Ridge. Almost everybody who comes here who reads about the Battle of Gettysburg, it all culminates in Pickett's Charge. The Confederate Army threw everything it had, 13,000 soldiers at the center of the Union line, which is exactly where a 22-year-old man from Wisconsin was ordered to be. And right here in the middle of it, is Alonzo Cushing's Battery A, 4th United States Artillery, uh, more or less right in the middle of this, what was going to be a huge tornado. Wounded not once, but twice, Cushing refused an order to have him fall back. What Cushing was determined to do was show those rebels one way or the other that his gun was going nowhere. In air filled with lead and shot, while others moved back, Cushing moved forward. This piece of ground falls, the Union line's broken. That Union line never fell, but Cushing did to one final Confederate bullet. His bravery is one of those stories here that fortunately has never been forgotten. His courage is carved in the spot where he fell, but always missing was an honor he had earned, but had never received. We are making an attempt to secure the Congressional Medal of Honor for Alonzo H. Cushing. 750 miles removed from Gettysburg on the land where Alonzo Cushing was born in Delafield. The spirit was still here. 94-year-old Margaret Zerwick decided to write a letter and a wrong. Oh, here, like this, this one. One letter. Uh, dear Senator Edward Kennedy. That turned into two. Letter to the Honorable F. James Sensenbrenner, Jr. And two turned into her crusade. Senator, the Honorable Russell Feingold. Well, I interned for Senator Bill Proxmire during the 80s, and Margaret Zerwick, who deserves all the credit for getting this going, was the one who brought it to the senator's attention back then. And in the years since. In 2003, to the Honorable George W. Bush. Every time an elected official, primarily from the South, said no, Margaret wrote another letter. Thank you. Margaret E. Zerwick. <laughs> I warned him about Margaret. He should be recognized. After more than 30 years of letters from Margaret and 151 years after he died, Alonzo Cushing finally has the honor he earned. I didn't quite jump up and down because I was too elderly by then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but in my mind, my mind jumped up and down. I promised to do it in her lifetime, and I'm glad it's finally occurring. But Margaret Zurich would tell you this isn't about her. It never was. It is about a man who was ordered to a position on a field of battle that made the choice to stay. It's a certain atmosphere about this place. Honor waited 151 years to be realized. The sacrifice made by Alonzo Cushing on that day, however, just like this place, is timeless. He saved the Union. The Congressional Medal of Honor was established during the Civil War to honor courage and bravery. Boy, has Gettysburg ever looked more beautiful. What a remarkable story. You know, I talked to Dave after that aired, and he said, in his 30-plus years' experience, this is the most memorable story he's ever done. For him and for many of us as well. When the People of 2014 continues, a Dodge County woman is drawing a lot of attention. And we'll introduce you to a Madison man whose life changes every single day.
Welcome back, everyone, to the People of 2014. And chances are you haven't heard of Hannah Miller, but you've probably seen her work. She sketches suspects. The nationally recognized Miller showed our Jennifer Hoff the key to creating a spot-on sketch. And just kind of darken it a little bit. Even up close. It's easy to see. And I'll use different types of pencils to get the eyes. That Hannah Miller's handiwork isn't that far off. Once the, the description is done and I get the actual, uh, say per se, booking photo of, of the suspect, then it's uh, very good to see how close it may be. She has sketched some 60 suspects since she started drawing for the Dodge County Sheriff's Office in 2005. As they say, you don't have to be talented to do the drawings. Miller instead memorizes guidelines. This is actually put together by the FBI. While witnesses flip through a collection of features. Basically, it's, it's their drawing. They're the ones that have given me that description from their memory. And you can't expect the memory to be perfect. Even Miller has made a mistake. But more often than not, smear that a little bit. Her craft has helped detectives close cases. When I walk up to the door and the, the, the suspect or person of interest might answer the door and I'm looking at the photo going, this, this is the person, this is the one who, who committed the crime. So it's a great tool to have Hannah around. There was a bevy of burglars. This person's friend had seen their drawing this picture up at a gas station. And a man who tried to lure two girls. I believe with only a few days, uh, the detectives had been able to break the case and had arrested this person. and He was convicted of the child enticement. About a dozen artists around Wisconsin are defying the digital age to instead put drawing on the map. The thing is the ability to uh, keep my skills fresh and going is, is the most important thing. It's no wonder then when Hannah Miller helps put a name to a face. To add a little bit of shading. She's really been making a name for herself. She comes out whenever we need her. Um, she's very flexible and does a really good job with the accuracy of her photos. But it is rewarding to be able to help out if I can. And Miller volunteers to sketch for several other counties as well. Talented woman. Yes. And speaking of talent, I see Jennifer again. She's doing well out in Portland, Oregon. Yes, taking her talent to the Pacific Northwest. Absolutely. Well, it is safe to assume most people look forward to their birthdays. It marks a milestone for the year. But that wasn't the case for one person. In fact, I met a Madison man who decided to stop celebrating his birthday nine years ago. That changed, however, last year when he turned 30. Caleb Andrew was deathly afraid of getting older. So when he turned 22, he asked family and friends to ignore his birthdays altogether. But then something happened. He was turning 30 and he decided to tackle his fear. He celebrated the day and decided to do something quite remarkable. The day was May 13th, 2013. He decided to do something different every day for a year. My basic rules were it had to be something that had meaningful impact or something I could learn from. So Caleb compiled a list of things he's never done before. In a city like this particularly, there's so many things that I had never expected, never knew, uh, so many things that are, are remarkable. And they were sitting around, sitting at, you know, my front door for years. Uh, but I'd, I'd never, because I was so bound to my routines, I'd never taken the opportunity to look outside of the scope of of what I was doing on a day-to-day -day basis. So he went to a yoga class. He fired a machine gun. And he baked a pie from scratch. He traveled to Colorado to snowboard. He did some things that he will never forget. Skydiving was one of them. You know, putting your foot outside 14,000 feet in the air and taking the leap uh, is a life-altering experience. Um, hang gliding was one of them. Uh, when I was in Ireland, I climbed the Wicklow Mountains and it was overlooking the Glendalock, and that was quiet and uh, un unbelievably beautiful. And he traveled to Italy and Iceland and New York City. I drove a Lamborghini on a closed racetrack, 600 horsepower vehicle, tearing around a street track. That was fun. I recently drove a tank, an army tank. Uh, that was incredibly fun. And he's eaten scorpion and beef tongue and intestine and chicken feet 
What did he learn from eating chicken feet? I learned they were a little bit nastier than I thought they would be. Uh, it was very rubbery, uh, very hard to eat, a lot of bones. But you tried it. I did. I did. And I think that's what it's about. You know, I would say probably a third to a half of the things that I did in the year were things that I never expected to do, things that I never re had a real desire to do, or things that I would have said, no, I will never do that. And, and that was probably one of them. And he made sure he volunteered his time at least once a month. All the volunteer work that I did, among other things, um, has, has made me a very different person. It's made me a better person. There are some that altered my life the moment they were happening. And it's rare, I think, to know that it's happening when you're in that moment. A flexible job with a lot of vacation time made this all possible. And as the year comes to an end, I'll look back. Would Caleb do this again? Absolutely. Will he continue this project? I don't, I don't know that he'll do something every day, uh, but my eyes are open for the first time in my life, and I'd be a fool to close them. I'd be an absolute fool to close them. It was quite an adventure for him. He did a, a lot of amazing things, and I talked to him recently. He's still in town. He's not doing something different every day, but he's still trying to keep his life interesting, volunteering, that sort of thing. I love that story because it makes you think, hey, maybe I should try that. Maybe like once a week we should do something. <laughs> that makes more sense. <laughs> when we come back, we'll meet a Reeseville family that received the gift of a lifetime. And we'll introduce you to the woman they call Professor Boom. When the People of 2014 continues. A Reeseville family is getting the gift of a lifetime. The Fenskys are a family of seven. Yeah, they were in desperate need of a change to keep their daughter alive. As Mary Jo Ola found out, they got an unexpected helping hand. Ow! Like many big families, the Fenske home is never boring. Every single one of them is different. It's fantastic. Meet mom, Shannon, dad, Kevin, and their five kids, Essen, Bamlock, Hewitt, Camilla, and Marissa. Little teeny tiny little country right here. Mm -hmm. That's where two of them are from. All five kids are adopted, each one with special needs. You can't bring everybody home and you can't help everyone, but there's certain things that we felt about these kids that we're very passionate about. If not us, then who? But five-year-old Marissa needs the most attention. She suffers from a brain condition that can bring on life-threatening events. Over the years, their home has become a danger. There's been a couple instances where I've actually tripped and fallen down the stairs while carrying her. And then the location as well. It's a 20-minute wait for paramedics to reach her. Shannon says because Reesville contracts with Watertown, paramedics make multiple stops before Marissa can get to American Family Children's Hospital. It's the worst feeling and it's, it's a helpless feeling. Then the Fenskys met Neil Mathwig, a Century 21 realtor. I had told them that their house was less worth less than what they had thought it was worth. Mathwick suggested several options, including a short sale. Then he learned more about the Fenske's circumstance. I'm going to take the realtor hat off and put the dad hat on and do everything I can possibly do to help your family get out of this and get closer to the hospital. So he did something most realtors might not do. He shared the family's story through a GoFundMe page and donations started coming in. You don't ever want to have to be the person on the receiving end of asking for help. But when it comes to your kids, I think you'll do anything. But it was at a realtor's conference when complete strangers donated more than $20,000, enough to move out. There were a lot of tears on the phone that day. I don't have any words to explain that feeling. No words, but now so much hope. Hi, pumpkin pies. We're told the family has the money to move into a new home, but the fundraising continues to cover other expenses. You can visit their GoFundMe page by going to channel3000.com. Well, it's a study of contrast and similarities. Our Dave Delosier found what a Madison College chemistry professor does during the day couldn't be more different from what she does on the weekends. And the air that you breathe out is not all carbon dioxide. At 8.30 in the morning, the importance of chemistry is sometimes lost. It has three sig things, 
Okay, so what's the answer with three sig figs? But make no mistake, chemistry is important. I mean, it's everything. Chemistry is, is everything that happens. And if there is anyone who knows... Collisions with the walls of a container. A thing or two about collisions. It is likely this woman. Now the particles are hitting each other. A chemistry professor at Madison College with a PhD by day. So it's just the collisions with the walls that cause the pressure. Right? But by night... Look out! Makes sense? She takes collisions... And they're wrong. ...to a whole new place. My real name is Marissa Rosen. Uh, M-A-R-I-S-S-A-R-O-S-E-N, and my derby name is Dutch Oven. Go, 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 go. A study in contrast. Ladies and gentlemen, let's get ready to roll! And it continues moving in a random direction until it hits something and bounces. Jammer! Yeah, we fall down a lot. Yeah! Ouch. And they have what we call an elastic collision. And she seems like so timid in class sometimes that I just didn't, wouldn't think she'd be shoving people around. Mighty mouth! I don't think people think of me in that way when they see me on the track knocking somebody over. For nine years now, the Dutch oven has been skating for the reservoir dolls and causing collisions on the track. Which means no energy is lost. While Marissa has been trying to explain them in a classroom. The other thing we talked about with gas particles. And the reaction she gets here. <laughs> is somewhat different. Do you guys notice? Then here. All my sig figs and all my units in my calculation. One yeah, woman in opposite you. worlds. <laughs> It's just so different. But if you were looking for the biggest difference, this is mercifully it. Well, first of all, I'm not allowed to hit people at work. But not that I would. Even those who need a wake-up call. Secretly, maybe. She just can't express it. So this is really good. We're a chemistry professor who doesn't just talk about collisions. What do you think? Give a big round of applause to the reservoir dolls. She lives them. I'm guessing she probably does. The chapter 7 homework. At Madison College. It's very different. This is Dave Delosier, WISC News 3. Okay. Still in her mid-30s, Marissa says she has no plans of hanging up her skates anytime soon. Nor should she. No, that's exactly <laughs> right. A lot of fun. Boy, it's been an incredible year. Yeah, it really has. We have met some amazing people. Thank you so much for joining us for the People of 2014. And we want to thank the fine folks at the Edgewater Hotel for this spectacular background. It's the first holiday season here at Edgewater. We're happy to be part of it. Absolutely. And here's hoping that you had a great 2014 and an even better 2015. We'll leave you with the sounds of the season from Tuba Christmas.